now. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is the uh, Perio Foundation webinar on open learning analytics in practice, um, very kindly co-sponsored by the Educause Student Success Analytics Community Group. Um, my name is Anne-Marie Scott. I am the Deputy Director of Learning, Teaching and Web at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm also the Chair of the Aperio Foundation Board. Um, for anybody who's dialed into the call today, um, we were also hoping to have a short presentation on the on-task learning analytics tool, um, but we weren't able to get the speaker for that lined up in time. Um, they do still want to talk, though, so we'll look at organising a separate session on that, because I think there's, there's quite a lot of interesting stuff to say there. Um, but that does mean we've got plenty of time today for our two other presenters. Um, so we have a first presentation from um, Pat Miller and his colleagues at the University of Notre Dame. And then we have Lou Harrison um, from North Carolina State University. So we're going to start off with Pat and his team. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand over to Pat um, to introduce yourself, your team and the presentation you're going to give us. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Uh, I'm, I'm Pat Miller. Um, we're having a little bit of echo, so let me see. Um, are, are you still hearing that echo? Yep. A little bit, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure where it's coming from. Anyway, uh, I'm Pat Miller. I'm, I lead our learning management and learning analytics at uh, Notre Dame. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of our members, Alex Ambrose, will not be able to be with us today, but let me then turn things over to Zhao Jing. Yeah, introduce yeah. Herself. Sure, thanks, Pat. Uh, good afternoon. I am Xiao Jing Duan, and I play the learning platforms and analytics architecture role here. Yes. Okay, without further ado, um, we'll introduce our topic. Uh, uh, we focused in on uh, one particular area that we're working on right now at Notre Dame, which is learning analytics for inclusive STEM student success. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking about integrating the uh, Aperio LRW with our enterprise data warehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, just a little intro about Notre Dame. Um, we're, we are a research one university, uh, about uh, 12,000 students. 1,200 faculty. We are ranked in the top 20 in the U.S. News Reports uh, rankings. And we're also in one of the top 10 university endowments. Uh, just a little bit of background. We're, I know we're known for football also, but <laughs> we do have some academics. Um, the challenge and goal. Um, we're, we're focused uh, right now on helping underserved and underprepared special populations. Uh, particularly with regard to STEM students uh, thriving. Um, our goal is to liberate and visualize admissions exam, uh, exams, homework data to create an inclusive learning analytics dashboard to maximize students' opportunities to thrive. Uh, in, in particular, we are focusing on our chemistry program, uh, the gateway of STEM majors. Uh, the course context is that uh, this the general chemistry gateway course is a foundational course for all science and engineering disciplines at Notre Dame. Uh, with 2,065 freshmen, 48% of them uh, take this general chemistry in their first year. Uh, it's one of the top five credit granting courses, uh, granting almost 3,800 credits each year. And these are some of the guiding research questions we're looking at. Um, we're looking at historical data. What, what's the best visualization of students' overall performance pathway in general chemistry? Uh, second, what are the best features for identifying the underprepared and underserved students in general chemistry? Uh, question three, what's the earliest and best predictors for identifying non-thriving students so that we can intervene early uh, in, uh, during their actual participation? And then uh, our fourth uh, item is how do we integrate the learning record warehouse, which we have implemented here, into our enterprise data warehouse to connect registrar and admissions data to the activity of students uh, in uh, as they uh, take their courses. 
So on the first question, uh, Xiao Jing is going to chime in here on, the, on this visualization that she has, uh, she can explain better. Oh, yes, sure. Uh, thanks, Pat. So uh, before I start to explain this chart, I'd like to add a comment that uh, we haven't uh, implement the open dashboard to the production level yet. Um, but we have been working on with uh, our faculty members and the students trying to figure out what information they want to get out of your dashboard and what's the best graph and the charts to communicate those uh, um, information. Uh, for example, we have been collaborating with a data visualization research lab from our computer science department. And uh, we develop a dashboard for this general uh, chemistry course. And uh, this view you are seeing here is one of the view on the dashboard. It shows all the 949 students' uh, exam grade pathways throughout the course. Can I take the mouse off? Thank you. Uh, for example, uh, you can see uh, like, uh, this group of students, yeah, this very light green line, and they got an A on exam three, but they crushed the letter and got a D on the final exam. On the, on the contrary, and uh, this group of students got an F on exam three, but they jumped back to an A on the final exam. This is just a screenshot. And with the real dashboard, the instructors can click on a specific path and bring, bring up another view shows who are those students and what the uh, course final course grade they got, and also their academic and demographic background information. Yes, that's our answer for the first research question. And... Uh, yeah, for the second research question, uh, what are the um, best features for identify the underserved and underprepared students? Um, but from the historic analysis, we found the three top features are the SAT or converted ACT scores is below 1380 and uh, have less than two past STEM AP tests. And there's a academic readiness score assigned by our admission office is a five or above. Next, I can show you how did we find these features. First, we did a linear regression analysis uh, on the students' final course grade in this general chemistry course and all those available demographic and ac academic features. And the graph on the left here shows a sig statistically significant correlation between the uh, general uh, chemistry uh, course grade and their SAT or ACT scores with a p-value less than 0 0.0001. And uh, based on the distributions of all the 949 students' SAT or ACT scores, we experimented with different cutoffs cutoffs for grouping the students into a high SAT ACT score and the lower SAT ACT score. And we eventually find 1380 is a good cutoff because with that cutoff, we can see a significant performance gap between the high score group and the lower score group. I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but uh, for the high score group, less than 2% of them got a, C, got a C or below. But for the low score group, and over 18% 18, 18 of them got a C or below in this general chemistry course. And um, yeah, that brings us to the answer to our third research question. Uh, what's the earliest and best predictor uh, for, to predict the students' non-thriving performance. And in this general chemistry course, we define the non-thriving as, as a C or below course grade. Uh, through the analysis, we find that the best predictors are having two or more 
uh, below the average of homework scores in the first six weeks. And also, uh, their score on the first exam, exam one, is less than 81. So with this combination of feature, we can identify 19 out of the 31 students who got a C or below in the last four. And as the graph on the right shows, and it captures five out of the nine, uh, out of the six students who withdrew from the course. So we were thinking if we were able to identify those students early and providing them with an effective boosting plan, they may not end up withdraw the course. And yeah. Yeah. Now, now we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit um, and talk about the Open LRW at Notre Dame. So we have implemented the Aperio Open LRW uh, so that we could capture uh, our Sakai LMS XAPI uh, feeds as well as other XAPI and Caliper data from the various uh, tools that are are used um, in in courses. We have not, however, implemented the predictive analytics module of OpenLAI. Um, the, the module, uh, the Aperio OpenLAI project learning analytics infrastructure um, also includes a predictive model that, um, that you'll hear more about uh, when Lou, Lou Harrison uh, gives his presentation. Uh, what we are doing right now is integrating our LRW data into our existing enterprise data warehouse so that other interested groups can do analytics on learning records and so that we in the learning analytics group can take advantage of student information systems data. As Zha Zheng was sharing, we, we've been looking at admissions as well as overall registrar data. Uh, sure. Uh, before I start, I see a question coming in asking for what is LRW. Sorry, we didn't uh, spell it. It stands for Learning Record Warehouse. Yeah. So uh, uh, some of you may already know that the old version of the Learning Record Warehouse used uh, the Elastic Search as the backend storage, and the latest versions are using the MongoDB as a backend storage. So we ended up with uh, like one years of historical data st stored in the Elasticsearch. And our ongoing data is uh, stored in MongoDB. To move our data um, to our enterprise data warehouse, Snowflake, we used a tool, ETL tool called Talent. And uh, for the historical data, we just extracted them from Elasticsearch into like over 100 uh, flat JSON file and created a talent job to copy those files into an S3 bucket first and then load them into a table in the Snowflake. And for the ongoing uh, LRW data, we have a talent job to create a snapshot of all the activity data happened in one day and then um, I, uh, export them into a JSON file also and put them in S3 bucket and then load from the S3 bucket into a table in a Snowflake. That job runs every day. So I should mention that Snowflake is the, um, is the database that is used by our enterprise data warehouse. Yes, yes, our enterprise data warehouse backend storage is a, is a snowflake. Yeah, and uh, this is just a screenshot of all the different components involved in the talent job. I'm not going to bother you with the technical details, but if you are interested in learning more about talent, and we are very happy to share all the pros and cons of the talent. And uh, with the data integration, uh, so we, <coughs> We, we have access to the admission data, like the students' uh, ethnicity, their uh, CUME GPA, and all those background information, and the students' course activity data. Additionally, we also have access to the, to the register data, like uh, what courses are they taking and what major do they declare. So with all this information in a centralized uh, place, we can develop a more holistic view of our students. Uh, I think next, uh, Pat is going to talk about our future work. 
Yes. Uh, so the um, our historical data and midterm, long-term tracking, uh, we're trying to uh, improve our STEM retention, especially for the underserved students. So that's kind of our uh, the work we're currently doing. We're using the historical data to now help us with um, trying to improve the retention of students in STEM programs. Uh, we also want to do an expanded uh, dashboard of analytics for our intro to engineering course. Uh, and we're, we're doing some, we're in addition, we're doing some homework and exam item analysis, uh, trying to help our instructors to improve the types of uh, exam items that are being used uh, to uh, assess students. Um, and we're hoping to push the course performance dashboards to instructors using the existing course evaluation distribution model. This is kind of a supplement to the open LRW dashboard, which is also available. Um, but we're, we're, we're seeing that there's a need for some additional performance dashboards for, for our STEM programs. Uh, but we'll, in that particular case, we'll be using our existing course evaluation distribution system. So that gives you, uh, that basically con uh, concludes our presentation. Um, if uh, anyone has some questions, we will be um, doing a QA and a uh, at the end of the presentations. Yeah. I think at this point, um, we're ready to have uh, Lou Harrison take over. Yep, that's great. Thank you very much, Pat. Lou, are you um, good to go? You're still muted. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I just took control, so I think I'm in good shape. Uh, looks uh, like you are. I cool. I'll oh, shut up. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Lou Harrison. I'm a director of educational technology services in a division of NC State called Delta. And uh, rather than go into that at length here, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit all on the way, if, if that's okay with everyone. Um, it is it is interesting to me that uh, um, Pat and I have worked together on things, and 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 I appreciate that the uh, the way they did things, we did things a little bit differently. Um, I'm go going to give you guys a very high level overview of uh, of how we did things. Uh, no no technical details, I promise. Uh, so 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 uh, so this is bas basically the outline. It, it's it's going to track pretty much the same way as. Uh, Pat's did. I'm going to go through the slides very quickly so that there is plenty of time at the end for us to uh, to field some questions. If anyone uh, has a question in the middle or I'm going too fast, uh, by all means, type something in the chat. I'll try and glance at it now and again. Uh, so just similar to Notre Dame, NC State is a an R1 institution. We, we're a land grant. A lot of students, a lot of faculty, ranked pretty well. Um, I think we also have a football team, uh, though we don't have Rudy, so there is that. <laughs> um, Delta, the division that I work in, in uh, at NC State, is it, it started as an acronym. It stands for uh, Distance Education and Learning Technology Applications. There's a long history of that. I won't go into it. Uh, but basically, we are a chunk of the provost offices. We, parts of Delta, do distance ed for the entire campus. Um, and parts of Delta do learning technologies. I'm in the learning technology side. And I have a shop. It's an IT shop that does all of the learning technologies at NC State that are done at scale, right at an enterprise level. Uh, so we're, we're separate from the central IT organization. We work for the provost. It's a nice place to be. If there's some horrible, you know, email crisis or paycheck crisis or something like that, they can't draw us into it. Uh, all we do is teaching and learning technology. It's, it's kind of nice. So, so just, I have a handful of slides to get us to where we are, and and I thought that the the journey was 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 important. So so at, at Educause in 2013, I happened upon a talk by Josh Barron, who was at the time at Marist College. He's since moved on, 
uh, about uh, open analytics. And that year, I happened to be looking for um, analytics possibilities, in particular predictive analytics. And I was kind of frustrated because a lot of the things that I saw claimed to be uh, predictive, but really weren't. They were, um, you know, you kind of like a, a nuclear submarine. You set a lot of gauges, and then and then uh, you get a warning when the gauges were were set off, which is not is not predictive, right? So so I was a little bit frustrated. Anyway, I went to Josh's talk. I liked what he was talking about. It was uh, it was an interesting. Uh, uh, project and 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 what's more was it was open right open is good uh, so that uh, people who know and understand the math can actually look at it and 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 see how it works obviously uh, so so uh, went went back home got some folks excited about the idea and put together a package and we we partnered with the folks at Marist and Unicon, a, 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 a contractor that, that has worked with Marist on this for, for a fair amount of time, and they do a lot of work with uh, Open Dash as well, uh, to, to bring what was what was originally called OAAI and was then called LAP to NC State, right? So we had some changes to do. Uh, Marist is a Sakai school or was a sky school when when this started we're a moodle shop uh so things are a little bit different but basically what we did was in that first phase we did a proof of concept using uh traditional relational database tools uh i think it was MySQL, and and sh and a bunch of our historical data and and from our lms and from uh our sis some bio demo data and 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 got some reasonable results. We were pretty happy with that. So so we decided we would uh, move on again. As I, as I said earlier, right? We do things at scale. Now they'll notice that uh, you know Pat uh, Pat's project was focused pretty specifically on on a, 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 a small number of courses. Uh, our goal at the time was let's if we're going to build this thing, let's build it so it will work for every course that NC State teaches. Uh, so we focused next on making it more automated, uh, bigger, able to run. The, the goal was to be able to do a run any night we wanted to do. So if, if in theory, we could run it every single night. So uh, that led to a sub goal of having it finish in less than 24 hours. So we put together a, a bunch of VMs and, and built a cluster, and we moved from the relational database tools to uh, big data tools, right? So we, we moved to Hadoop from uh, uh, and the associated tools that go with it. And again, similar similar results. We're running this all in the background, uh, not telling anybody that we're doing it, not sharing the data. But we at the end of the semester, we could, of course, look and see how we're doing. Uh, so then, <laughs> a lot of phases in this thing. We focused on the the the, the learning records warehouse because uh, we had so so at, at this point we have Moodle data, we have uh, bio demo data, bio demo data coming from Sys, and we wanted to think about at least incorporating other tools. We have other tools. We use Zoom. We use uh, MediaSite. Uh, there's a handful of other tools. One called PlayPosit that we use. It'd be nice if we can extract data from them to put them into a learning records warehouse uh, so that we can you know use that data in all of the courses so so uh, uh, so so we have begun that process we have an NLRW um, we have not actually put any other data in it uh, we start we decided to start with media site which is a classroom capture uh, technology and it turns out that um, mapping to the people in the class with media site can be a little bit of a pain and we're still wrestling with that um, i will say if you if you are going down this route and you're planning on standing up an lrw it's good to start your project there right get the the records warehouse up and running and start populating it with data because the more historical data you have the better your model will work um phase four which we're just wrapped up now was was uh, uh, mostly focused on 
the uh, the dashboard, right? So so we 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 took Open Dash. Uh, we actually met with some some again some of the folks at Unicon and Marist and and Pat and his crew to say what you know what would make the dashboard better, right? And and so we actually funded a, a number of substantial changes and not, not much the the slides are really small because i'm on a laptop in a hotel room <laughs> but if this, if you if you can zoom in on that picture in the slides this is a composite of several of the um uh the the rollovers that we had put into open dash to tell you you know informative messages about what what the data mean and we also had unicon add some flexibility so that you can change some of the words. What we found were the words that the, the Open Dash people picked for some of the, you know, the terminology that they used wasn't the same terminology that our faculty are comfortable with. And comfort is key here. So, so the ability to change those words to the ones that we use on our campus was super important to us. So, so, so we added, added that as well. Um, Oh, you know what? I think I forgot to mention. We 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 did a small pilot last year, uh, ten ish courses. Uh, basically, it was put together really fast, so it wasn't a representative sam sample of courses by any stretch. Um, it was generally people who have worked with our group in the past that we were comfortable working with. Uh, there were some questions about accuracy. We're not sure we we trained the model particularly well for this first go around. And one of the interesting results, everyone said they're really pleased with the notion of getting help, right? Getting data that helps them to help students. Uh, they really want to understand the inputs and further, they want to feel like the things that matter are intuitive. And sometimes that runs um, uh, against, you know, what matters, <laughs> uh, to, to, to be blunt, right? Because sometimes the things that matter aren't particularly intuitive. So, so, so that I found very interesting, right? So uh, that's, that's where we are right now today. Uh, some lessons that we've learned over the past couple of years, it's, these these things are complicated, especially with the uh, the big t data tools. Everything takes a fair amount of time. Uh, plan for that. If you can get buy-in from the top, that would be awesome. Uh, it's a great place to start. We 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 did not have buy-in from the top. We still don't have 100% buy-in. It's unfortunate. Uh, so it makes things go a lot slower. Um, we had a bunch of questions like Pat did at the beginning. Every question we answer. Uh, generate some answers, which generates more questions. It seems uh, so. So again, uh, factor that in, uh, and then and then start in in my mind. Start small, but plan big, right? So so you know, Pat started with a course. Uh, they're they're planning on you know doing more for sure. We we started with a handful that we're doing. Uh, in a pilot, but but the plan is to have the infrastructure in place to do uh, this for every single course in NC State. Uh, what's next? Another another phase is coming. We're going to do another pilot next year. Um, a little bit more focus. Ask better questions of the faculty that are involved. Well, we we recently engaged. We we bought basically an analytics grad student to help us because we don't have a lot of analytics experience in my shop so so uh, she's just come on uh, she's going to help us with the modeling and the training and uh, mapping our inputs to to, to the open LRW because the there's not always a one-to-one -one mapping from from Moodle or other tools into what you know what choices you have in 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 the model. Um, we've got we've done a first pass of some some intervention verbiage. She may help with that as well, and and she's going to help with the pilot as well. So that's that's kind of nice. Um, we're also working on tuning the infrastructure to uh, improve the efficiency. Uh, we're thinking. My understanding is Marist is running with a newer model now. We may look at the uh, at uh, migrating to that model as well, uh, and then and then a, a, an opt-in rollout um, for people who want to use it, and then a general rollout after that that will cover you know everybody. Uh, 
on campus. So, so, so that's, that's the direction we're headed. And that's it for me. So I guess we're, uh, wow, we did, that was like perfect <laughs> timing wise. Uh, so, so I guess now we'll just open it up for, uh, to any questions that anyone has. And if, uh, if you'll uh, preface them by asking, uh, uh, letting us know who, you know, whether it's the Notre Dame people or the NC State person that you're asking that, or all of us, that's fine too. And for those that don't have the ability to um, speak, um, just type it in the chat and we're, we're keeping an eye on the chat as well. So let us know what you would like to ask. And I can see people typing. That was me. Ah. <laughs> well, uh, I might have... Speak up and talk via microphone if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, please do. Um, do you want to tell us who you are? Yep. Oh. My name is Tim Wheat. Um, I am Learning Management System and Administrator uh, Manager at Bradley University. My question has to do with the data that you're pulling out of Sakai. Um, what, what exactly were you pulling? Like if I pull this, I mean, I can get whatever data I want. Um, like were you doing presence counts in sites? Were you looking at uh, lessons page usage at all? summary inside of the tools? What kind of data were you yeah. using? We're, we're using the data that is coming from the XAPI um, plugin that is provided for Sakai. Uh, I'm not exactly okay. sure who developed that, but uh, the data has to be in X, at least in XAPI format. Ideally, in the future, we're hoping that um, the caliper uh, feed will be provided. Fortunately, the LRW, the Learning Record Warehouse, was uh, structured so it would accept both um, Caliper and XAPI data. And so the XAPI data is basically um, just about all events that uh, our student type interactions that are done in Sakai will get fed through XAPI. I don't know if Zhao Jing, you want to Oh uh, yes, sure. One comment I like to add is, uh, so it depends on what what kind of tools uh, the course is using. Like for our first year Moreau course, that course is designed very well, and it takes advantage of all the different tools in Sakai, like the lessons page, the test and the quizzes, assignments, and so we are able to pull the data on all those activities. But for some other courses, uh, they not necessarily use Sakai to do all the course activities. Like for this general chemistry course, they are using a third-party homework tool called uh, Sapling. So we, because Sapling is not able to send us either XAPI or Caliper data directly to our LRW, we have to get a data dump from them on a weekly basis. And in, so, yeah, it just depends on what tools or uh, what activities right. the course are uh, using. Yeah. I should, this is Pat again from Notre Dame. I should mention that the first project we did actually was that first year course that all students had to take. And that's mm -hmm. actually an ongoing project right now. Right, yeah, that's uh, the biggest uh, credit bearing course in, on our campus. Right. Yes, all the um, first year students are required to take that course. This general chemistry course is required for all the students who wants to be in a STEM major. Yeah. But unfortunately, we weren't able to design the, the chemist, general chemistry course. So therefore, we're limited on what kind of data we can, we can get. So we're trying right. to get as much. So that's another thing about you know, a lesson learned. Uh, you know, depending on the types of courses you're targeting, um, you may have to do all kinds of data munging to get, mm -hmm. get what you need. Right. What I was hoping was you guys were like, yeah, uh, you know, pres.begin, which is a pretty standard Sakai thing. And the classes with pres.begins in them, you know, the ones that had more, you know, we were able to track this. Yeah. Yeah, so 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 we're taking a different approach. Like I said, we're we're using Moodle and uh and, and we're we're tracking pretty much every every click. Um initially we were we were pulling stuff out and munging it by hand out of the logs. And um and now I think we're using caliper uh because 
Moodle just started supporting Caliper. Um, right. One 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 of the uh, one of the things I feel like is is interesting is 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 that again we're taking this holistic approach of doing it for every course, and we're we're using the um, um, the activity in the course as a as a as a proxy for how much stuff there is uh be you know how how learning management system intensive the course is and we're actually uh for training purposes cohorting up uh different models right so one model that where the courses don't use the lms at all one where they use it a little bit one where they use it medium and one where they use it a lot and it turns out that our accuracy tracks with that so the more they use the lms the more accurate the model is that's super good for for us it means that uh <laughs> you know the lms is kind of important uh right. but but it it, it does it, when we were doing all the courses together, all of the courses that used it a little bit or didn't use it at all sort of diluted the accuracy of the rest. And it made it look like the model really only cared about biodemo data, specifically GPA. Uh, GPA. <laughs> um, but uh, this this way we say, no, really the LMS makes a difference. And, and in those early weeks, it really matters. Gotcha. Um, can I introduce myself? Uh, some of you on the call know me, uh, some don't. Uh, I'm the primary Sakai uh, admin for Illinois State University. I'm involved in several Sakai committees. Your presentation is really good. Um, I've uh, brought to our meeting today um, our director of our data uh, analytics area. And uh, some of you on the call might remember my protege who transitioned off of Sakai, Ben Raphael, sure. uh, but about a year ago, maybe two years ago, Ben had uh, attended one year presentations and uh, Ben had uh, stood up a experimental data analytics server, but then got transitioned uh, to another team within our organization. Um, I have the people on our call that handle our data warehouse. They're an awesome team, very smart data scientists. Um, uh, talk to me through chat right now. Really happy with your presentation. And just basically, I wanted to let you know that after the call, um, you will be getting an email from Tim Donahue and Rachel Hart, which are our senior leadership that handles data analytics for Illinois State. They would like to know a little bit more about your tools and some of your processes. We're trying to take our experimental server um, and bring it um, into our data warehouse with the goal of eventually going into production. And uh, I think we need just a little bit more guidance from what you're giving at this presentation on how you guys would have, you guys would be open to doing that. Sure. Um, yeah, certainly we would be glad to, uh, you know, help out. Uh, I just, Realized that Lou had put his uh, email, and I, I don't think we had put ours, so I'm putting it in the uh, chat. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sure. It's funny. Any other questions? Yeah, I I should uh, mention that our LRW does. Um, does take data from all the Sakai courses, but like Lou said, you know, it depends on how well the particular courses use the tool, you know, use your LMS. If they're not using the LMS much, then they're not gonna get very useful analytics out of it. Um, and um, we have had some success also getting some data from um, uh, other, vi other video tools, um, uh, Panopto. like Panopto yeah. and um, uh, in the past we also got data from the other Kaltura. Kaltura the other video vendor they are trying more and more of the vendors are trying to support caliper <laughs> they say they are I don't know yeah, if they right. really are um, yeah and 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 we're sort of well as, as I mentioned um, our goal, our goal at some point is to be able to make, make predictions available for every course, you know, regardless of how much they use the LMS and 
to give who, you know everyone the best prediction that we can give them and 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 so what that means perhaps is that the ones that don't use the LMS may not have quite as good uh, a, a prediction as the ones who do use it and the ones who use it a little may not have quite as good a prediction as the ones who use it a lot and 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 uh, you know our 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 goal is to have a prediction for people early enough in the semester where where helping will matter right so that's we're looking at the first you know four weeks of a regular semester or something along those lines so 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 trying to trying to get into the LMS early is is is, is good um interestingly enough one of the challenges that we we seem to keep having is that um there's no realistic way for us to know in in someone's grade book how much a column is worth because a lot of our faculty don't set up their formulas on how much a column is worth until like right before grades are due so so you know you could have uh, five five columns in the grade book um in the first couple of weeks of a semester and and three of them are worth like percent of the total grade and one of them is worth 25 percent because it's a quiz or something or you know a full-on test and we we have to just assume that they're all equally weighted because they're not generally our faculty like i said don't generally set that up in advance there was a question about privacy earlier in the chat um implications um in our research projects that are targeted we do um we we, we do have students we, we require that uh, students sign um um a consent, consent form. Yeah, yeah, they can either they can opt out if they choose to. Yeah, so we don't analyze their data. Yeah, we we have not done that. It's it's our data at this point. Uh, we, right, we, right. we, yeah. we 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 collect it. It's 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 our data, and and we're using it for good. We're not, you know. Right. It's funny. Um, the only people who ever bring this up to us are faculty, and and generally. The older faculty at that, the students, um, when you know when we talk to them, they 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 feel like we're using their data anyway. That they they kind of expect it, right? Because they go on Amazon and they see all the things that the, that Amazon tells them that they should buy, and and they go to Google, and Google knows the questions that they're going to ask before they ask it, and and they just sort of expect that uh, if we have data about them, that we're going to use it, um, right. I think there are some interesting questions in there about um, there's some tensions in there about duty of care. I, I come obviously from a European context and there's some different obligations on us in the data protection space around transparency. But one of the things our students do expect that we use data and there's a little bit of a tension around if we have it and we know something, we also have an obligation to act on it, which some of our faculty find you know, they, they find that quite challenging. So there's the, we don't, we shouldn't track it, we shouldn't act upon it. And then the flip side of it is absolutely, we have a duty of care to do something with this stuff. And so it throws up some, some quite interesting conversations. You might be interested in some some work that, um, it was done in, in a European context, but um, I think it's probably reasonably transferable around attitudes to learning analytics. It was a European project called the Sheila Project, mm -hmm. and they surveyed large numbers of students. And, then, and there was a kind of privacy paradox thrown up by that, that there are some concerns about privacy and what's going on and students want transparency, but they are willing to give up data and have an element of surveillance if they feel there's a benefit to them as well. So there's a balancing act in here. And that's been super helpful for me to be able to use that with in conversations with some of our faculty to kind of say, well, actually, the students have a view and it's a more nuanced view maybe than, than you've got. Right. That's Sheila like the name? Sheila like the name. Yeah, there's some Australian colleagues who were involved in this. Ah, now, now it's <laughs> or, or, well, I don't know they're involved kind of around it, but yeah, Sheila. Uh, and there's another one um, called Lala, which is the same kind of project structure, but in a Latin American context. I, see, I don't yeah. think that's concluded yet. Yeah, I'll put I, a link. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. Some Josh has yeah, put a link. Josh to the put a, a, a link to that one. Yeah, so so I so I, I definitely will say that uh, oh, you know the the whole 
analytics or for student success thing is a relatively new thing, but even newer is the the the, the notion of ethics around it. Um, and and uh, I, I'm I'm interested to see where 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 the uh, the the ethics conversations lead. And they're 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 young at this point, so if any of you guys have thoughts on that, they're you should get involved in, in, in those discussions. And I see there's a there's a question in the chat. Uh, did you start with what types of information you want to know and then collect the data you want or possibly collect data and let's see what information we can retrieve from? Um, yes, so, so, so the way our modeler works is you throw in a bunch of data um, and or a bunch of fields and a whole bunch of historical data with those fields and with the historical data you of course also know how well the students did at the end of the course right because you know their final grade and you just plug all that stuff in and the model then tells you what's important right our goal is to predict success uh so if uh you know it it does some some magic stuff behind the scenes. That's my non-math version of how that how it works. To to decide based on all of the historical data that I fed it, you know which of those fields are how much important in the data, and and uh, and uh, that's that's as technical as I go. The if if uh, if if anyone wants something more technical than that, then you should talk to the folks at at Marist or read the uh, the initial paper uh, that was linked in 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 my first or my first substantive slide. Uh, for us, it's uh, like we are taking both, both approach, uh, approaches. Yeah. We started with uh, just collecting all the data we can collect. And uh, like the students click on a resource and how long of the videos they watch. But after analyzing those data, we find they are kind of correlated to the students' learning outcomes, but they are not uh, strong predictors. Then we look around to see, oh, what other information we can collect. Like uh, we went to our I IR research office and to try to gauge the student's demographic and their ac uh, academic background information. And then we find that those information can definitely help us with a prediction. So yeah, it's a, <laughs> we are taking both approaches. Could I use and abuse my pri my presenter privileges to ask a question myself, if that's OK? Sure. <laughs> um, I saw a, an interesting presentation from, um, oh, I think it was Echo360 at one of their conferences. Um, and some of the issues that I think we've been touching on here is that quite a lot of this data is a proxy for something else that's going on. So it, um, and it's, Sometimes it's a, a proxy for something about instructional design. Sometimes it's a proxy for something about student goals and motivation. And there's a lot of other stuff going in, on in here that is not well captured in the data. And they were using some of their engagement tools in their lecture recording systems, so the you know, question and answer type tools, um, to ask um, some quite pointed questions of students in the first couple of weeks of teaching about motivation, goal, stress level, well-being, you know, a range of stuff, nothing too onerous, but um, but in, enough that they got some, some of this additional data, which they were then able to use in conjunction with information about how the lecture recordings were being used to generate some predictions about success. And it seemed to me that that, that was quite a neat and relatively simple way of adding additional information um, to, to enrich this kind of data set that I hadn't really considered using some of these in-classroom tools to do quick polls and surveys mm -hmm. that would give you some more of that contextual information. Right. And I wondered if that was an approach others had seen or, um, you know, it doesn't fit neatly into an XAPI statement, so we get into right. some of the same, the same issues again, but it seemed to be quite a productive approach, maybe. Uh, yes, we haven't used an in-classroom um, pool 
uh, of survey tools. But for our Maru project, after we identify the students who are demonstrating a uh, non-striving behavior, like they are missing a lot of homeworks, and we send them a Qualtrics survey and asking, yeah, what could be the possible reasons for <coughs> their behavior? Is it uh, um, too much course load, a stress from uh, from the school, or something going on with their personal personal life? So we were able to collect a lot of interesting data using that. Yeah, I totally agree. Using the surveys or pools, that's another channel to collect more mm -hmm. rich data. Yeah. Yeah. So so our our campus is uh, not too long ago. Uh, acquired a site license for top hat i don't know if you guys are familiar with yeah top we hat, use it here it's a it's a yeah it's a it's like those clickers but it's clickerless right you it's a byod you bring your own device and you can do you can do polls you there's a lot it's there's a whole ecosystem uh but but the 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 first reason that we we bought it was people were using clickers in classrooms and students were having to buy uh clickers and carry them around and they'd lose them and, and et cetera. It was just a, a nightmare. So, so a bunch of folks were using top hat and on campus. So we negotiated a way to do it. So the students don't have to pay anything out of pocket and it's getting a lot of play and we're, you know, it's on our roadmap to get them to pressure them to do uh, you know, a caliper feed or an X API feed, hopefully caliper so that we can then, um, capture that in our learning record warehouse and add it to the mix again like with the the media site thing that i talked about earlier that there's a challenge in that right now the way their technology works each polling event or you know uh, a class of people that that you would you would do several events is an atom that just floats out in space somewhere and it's not associated with anything else right so they're they're working on the infrastructure so that their system understands that you know this particular group of people is you know bio 101 section 3 fall 2019 nc state um so that we can then associate it with the right course and sort of close the loop when we put stuff into the, the lrw um so hopefully that's coming soon and i'm i suspect especially early in the semester that those types of of quizzes and participation you know whether you participate whether you got it right or wrong or whatever will be uh a, a very effective uh piece of data for us to have again uh you know it's, it's not always about the intuition uh but uh but it seems it seems reasonable that that would that would be useful oh thank there, you very much there is a question um i believe Anne marie that you referred to above from yes Frank. yeah, yeah. The, the chat yeah. moved on and the question was hanging there so it'd be good to go back to it yeah um 444 it was a question about did you start with what types of information you want to know and then collect data or mm -hmm. collect data and then see what you can derive from it yeah and that's tied to this the other question too suppose you set up the hypothesis and those are hypotheses well. yeah yes um i can share a little bit about our first year Moreau experience project the reason we started analyzing and that course is because we have this hypothesis that if students don't do well in that course, they may not do well on other courses in their first year. So their first year QM GPA will be not, uh, not as ideal as we, we expect. And uh, yeah, so we were able to collect the students and their performance data in that Moreau course. Yes. And uh, after uh, identifying those students who are not doing well in the morale, we also um, were able to collect their uh, first year accumulated GPA. And it shows their first, uh, first year accumulated GPA is lower comparing the rest of the students. So in a short, the short answer is, yeah, we have the hypothesis first and then try to collect the data that aligned with that hypothesis. So, so, so Sang Hyun also posted another question about: Do we have any surprising results 
that we found against our expectations. Um, against our, we didn't really have expectations. We had intuition, right? You think certain things are going to make a big difference and certain things aren't going to make a big difference or, or whatever. One, one of the things that, that we found very interesting was that the number of forum posts read by a student is in inversely proportional to success, right? So the more forum posts that you read, <coughs> excuse me, the, the, the less likely you are to succeed. And it wasn't a huge difference, but it was an inverse correlation. And it didn't really um, make sense to us, but it, it, turns out, it turns out that if you think about it, it maybe does make sense, right? Because if a student isn't doing well and they don't know any effective way to get help for themselves, what might they do? They might go into the forum and start digging through and trying to read other students' posts and trying to figure things out on their own. And, uh, um, um, and, and yeah, so, so cor correlation for sure uh, causation is always tough, right? So that was that last bit by me was a guess, <laughs> right? That uh, that that we knocked around for a while, but uh, uh, co correlation is easy. Causation is is a lot tougher, right? So the and that's the the challenge I think our faculty have is they want to know why. Why does this matter? Why doesn't this matter? And all I can tell them is well, because the model said so. Um, so so. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, so um, I'm, I'm not an expert in how to get to causation, but I suspect it involves a lot more uh, hands-on and talking to people than, uh, than, than we are currently doing. Yeah, we had a similar observation in this general chemistry course. And um, because we were able to collect the students' homework behavior data, like how many times they attempted a homework question, we find uh, the, more the, uh, the more attempts a student have and the, the lower homework grades they have. So it's kind of a negative correlation. But sometimes it makes sense. It's because they, <laughs> they don't know the topic very well. They cannot get it correct the first time. So they are trying it multiple times, trying to get it correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree with you guys who posted that the, the qualitative work is the way to ferret out the, the, the cause. Um, it's just, it's not my cup of tea, right? There, there, there are certainly other people who are, who do that. It's not, uh, <laughs> I, I'm very happy with things that, that, that we can, you know, chug and plug and, and, or plug and chug and, and, and get numbers out. Okay, we are heading close to time, um, and I don't want I don't want to cut questions short. But I think we probably need to take one last question if anybody has a burning one, and if not, we'll draw the session to a wrap. Do we have any more questions that people want to? Oh, Ron is typing, and Josh is typing. It's going to be a fight to the death as to who gets their question in <laughs> first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Josh is just voting for social science grad students yeah. for doing qualitative research. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Thank you, Ron. We have more people typing as well. Super. Thanks to all you guys oh, for, you uh, for, yeah. for, for showing up. Um, and... Uh, my email is in the presentation. I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm at I'm at a conference this week, so if I don't if I don't get back to you right away, that's I'm going to say that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your presentations. And um, I'm going to save the chat record, and I'm also going to I'll stop the recording in a moment, but we'll be taking the recording and making it available online as well. So if you want to revisit anything here, pick up email addresses um, and maybe revisit any of the presentations, then you'll be able to do that and obviously share it on with people who couldn't be here today. Um, thank you everybody for your questions. Um, and thank you to Lou and Pat and colleagues for, for putting your presentations together. That was great. I don't know how we give a round of applause on um, a <laughs> webinar. 
don't know. Right sometimes, sometimes there's a little clap button. A big blue button doesn't seem to have one. So we can all just imagine a round of applause. All right. Well, take care, everybody. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Bye. Bye. Bye.